Ok. ¿Se puede ver? ¿Can you see that? Ok, perfecto. Sí, sin problema. Caballos. Ah, un minuto. Ok, bárbaro. Vamos. Listo, estamos eh, en vivo. Hello everyone and welcome to the third virtual lecture on Korean studies organized by the International Program of Korean and East Asian Studies of the University of Costa Rica. This is Filippo Costantini and I'm the coordinator of this program. Today, we are really honored to have two important international guests, Prof. Antonio Fiori from the Asian Institute of the University of Bologna and Eduardo Luciano Tadeo of the Universidad de Iberoamericana in Mexico. Professor Fiori will share with us his research presenting the lecture Kim Jong-un, North Korea, a 10-year assessment. And Professor Tadeo will help us to start the discussion before the Q&A session. Before introducing Professor Fiori, I remind you that this lecture is the last conference of the cycle for this semester, and we will start with a new cycle from next September. I also remind you that this lecture is broadcast in the YouTube channel of the Instituto de Investigación Filosófica of the University of Costa Rica. And you can leave comments, greetings, and questions in the same channel and in the Facebook pages of the School of Philosophy of the University of Costa Rica and our, of course, Facebook page, of, uh, which is called PSEA. Let me introduce Professor Fiori. Antonio Fiori is an Associate Professor of History and Institution of Asia at the Department of Political and Social Sciences of the University of Bologna in Italy and President of the Asian Institute. He has been a visiting scholar at the United International College of Zhuhai, the East-West Center on Oluru and the Pyongyangak Institute for Korean Studies, Seoul National University. In the last 10 years, he has been continuously engaged in teaching activities in several universities of the Republic of Korea, Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, Korea University, Iwa Women's University. His research interests focus on inter-Korean relations and North Korea domestic and foreign policy. Among his recent publication, The Rutledge Handbook of Europe, Korean Relations, Rutle, 2022, and the Korean Paradox, Domestic Political Divide and Foreign Policy in South Korea, Rutledge, 2019. Welcome, Professor Fiori. Thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, uh, it's very nice, actually, to be here. I um, would like to express my gratitude to both uh, Filippo and uh, Eduardo. Um, I must confess it's the first time that I lecture for a Latin American university, and this is, uh, you know, um, a very exciting. So I, I really hope it's not the last time, anyway. Um, <clears throat> I would like uh, to share my screen, actually, in order because I have um, uh, a presentation for today. So I really hope that uh, you can see my slides. Uh, well, actually, what I would like to do today um, uh, with you uh, is, uh, you know, talking about uh, Kim Jong Un and, um, um, you know, eventually if and to what extent actually North Korea has changed under his rule, uh, because we have come, uh, you know, in the last few months, actually, exactly in April, uh, we have come to uh, celebrate the um, first 10 years of um, Kim Jong-un's rule. So uh, I think that this is 
a very good um, occasion to understand, um, uh, you know, something more about um, his rule and, um, you know, how uh, eventually he is contributing to modify his country or, uh, you know, eventually what kind of political strategy he is playing. So I have titled my presentation Kim Jong-un's uh, Jong North Korea 10-year assessment. And, uh, you know, my introduction is very easy. I would uh, actually like to um, start saying uh, that, um, you know, in April, on the 12th uh, of April, we have celebrated uh, the, the, 10, the, the 10th anniversary of Kim Jong-un's rule in, uh, in North Korea. Actually, um, um, as you probably know, Kim Jong-il, his father died in uh, uh, December, exactly on 17th of December 2011. But actually, um, you know, um, Kim Jong-un uh, seized power, officially seized power in um, April um, uh, 2012 uh, by becoming the first secretary of the party. So that's why actually we do, um, uh, we do take into consideration 10 years time span from, um, you know, uh, 2012. Um, when he became the leader, uh, we basically knew nothing about him. Um, we didn't have any pictures of him apart from one that actually depicted Kim Jong-un as uh, a very, um, you know, young um, um, child. And uh, uh, basically, the only thing that we knew uh, was that, uh, you know, he had been educated in Switzerland, but actually, this is something that uh, has always happened with, um, um, you know, young Kims, okay, both him and his brother actually started in, uh, in Switzerland. So, uh, you know, he was very young when he seized power in 2012. Uh, he was more or less 27. We, I'm saying more or less because, of course, uh, we still ignore how old is he uh, exactly. So um, he might be uh, 27 and he should be around 38 uh, nowadays. Um, and on top of that, actually, he was pretty much unexperienced. Um, that's a matter of fact. Uh, he had no experience that at all. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, this comes out of um, uh, something that we need to understand because we have had two different, um, um, two different uh, transitions in um, uh, North Korea, right? The first one actually was from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-il and it happened in 1994, actually, when the father of the nation died. And the second one is the one um, I'm talking about to today. But, uh, you know, if we do compare the two transitions, actually what we discover, uh, you know, very, um, very vividly uh, is basically the fact that uh, unlike the first transition, which was pretty much prepared, actually Kim Jong-il had a lot of time to uh, prepare to uh, to prepare himself actually to seize power after uh, his father, uh, you know. Unlike these, uh, in occasion of the second transition, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong Un had no um, had no time at all because, of course, actually North Korea was caught by surprise when uh, you know uh, Kim Jong Il died in twenty eleven. Um, he suffered from a stroke in 2008, and possibly until that point, he had never um, taken into consideration the possibility of a uh, transition of power. But that was the moment when uh, eventually Kim Jong-il started to understand that he needed to choose among his um, sons um, who could be the one, you know, to uh, eventually succeed him. Okay, and I will uh, get back to this point um, um, very soon. Um, when Kim Jong-un actually became the leader in North Korea, uh, you know, many scholars, many pundits, many commentators and journalists, actually everybody started to talk about what was the future of North Korea, what could be the future of North Korea, okay? 
um, uh, according to uh, some commentators, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un was unexperienced, uh, what could happen was a military coup, which, of course, actually had to be organized by armed forces. Uh, according to somebody else, actually, uh, there could be um, a regime collapse. Uh, so, you know, a kind of power struggle uh, among different elites, and uh, eventually this could bring the regime itself um, on the verges of collapse. And uh, uh, according to somebody else, actually, uh, the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un had lived in Europe could be beneficial um, to North Korea, um, meaning that it could eventually lead his country to, you know, um, the implementation of liberal reforms and eventually to uh, change, to modify the nature of the political regime in uh, North Korea. Um, to tell you the truth, I have no proofs actually to offer you, but I was uh, totally convinced that actually uh, you know, North Korea was um, undergoing any changes, okay? I was totally convinced that actually Kim Jong-un would rule his country as, you know, his father and grandfather had done before him, okay? Um, you know, if uh, I have been studying North Korea for uh, 25 years now, and actually when you study the country for so, uh, you know, much time, actually you do understand that uh, the country actually suffers, if you want, or is affected from some kind of repetitions in um, its political life. And so actually it was convinced that nothing was going to, uh, to change. Um, what we can say actually, uh, coming to, uh, you know, to the same country and the same leader after 10 years, actually, we can say that uh, eventually Kim Jong-un has, um, has, um, uh, has um, effectively um, consolidate, um, consolidated his power. He has uh, basically established him uh, as a strong dictator. And, uh, you know, basically there has not been um, throughout the 10 years I'm um, talking of, uh, you know, any kind of regime instability, but of course there have been political uh, changes or changes in the political system. And this is uh, something that uh, I would like to highlight, I would like to really stress because actually those who, who think that, you know, North Korea actually is a kind of monolith, uh, you know, are totally wrong. And uh, um, of course, he has uh, transformed himself into a skillful leader. And I'm saying so uh, because of course, uh, we, have, um, we have seen actually um, some of the actions, uh, diplomatic actions that actually have uh, happened or have taken place under Kim Jong-il, like you know, the uh, two official meetings with uh, uh, President Trump, you know, in Singapore first and in Hanoi um, later, and, you know, several meetings with Moon Jae-in, uh, South Korean president, and several meetings with Xi Jinping, uh, you know, uh, Chinese president. So actually, he has become kind of a diplomatic leader. And, uh, you know, um, uh, actually, I would like uh, to talk, to briefly talk about uh, what I consider, you know, three different uh, stages of um, um, uh, in uh, Kim Jong-il's um, uh, rule. So the first one um, from actually uh, 2012 to 2017 is based on the consolidation of his power. And of course, actually, we need to talk about the implementation of the Byongjin line, which is, you know, the official strategy that uh, eventually Kim Jong-un has implemented. The second is, um, uh, you know, um, actually uh, marked by uh, economic development, but, uh, you know, also by uh, diplomatic opening of the country. And, you know, when we talk about diplomatic um, uh, opening of the country, we need to understand that actually, uh, you know, North Korea implements 
uh, this kind of strategy in order to give uh, you know, stability to, to the external environment. This is a very, very clear and very, very important message, okay? Um, stability actually is pretty much important uh, in order to nurture, actually, if you want, nuclear uh, you know, ambitions. And the third uh, stage is eventually something that has um, recently happened, uh, that is reversing uh, the, the measures that had previously um, been undertaken. Uh, so uh, eventually uh, relying again on self-reliance and state centrism. When I uh, talk about self-reliance, actually, of course, I'm talking about the North Korean, um, um, you know, basic philosophy that is to te. And, uh, you know, um, I'm also eventually mentioning the fact that, um, uh, you know, uh, recently speaking, actually, the regime has uh, implemented, has tightened uh, social and ideological control in order to deter potential domestic instability because of some reasons that, uh, you know, I will clarify in a few minutes. So these are the three different steps that I would uh, touch on. Okay, uh, let's start with these. As I said, actually, when he became the leader, he, uh, you know, uh, was very weak. Okay, and eventually, the weak power base, you know, uh, was something that we all um, examined and analyzed. Okay, um, the transition, if you study, you know, uh, regime transitions, actually, especially uh, dictatorships, uh, you know very well how, uh, you know, important and how, uh, you know, weak the regime itself uh, can be during transitions, transition periods, okay? So that was a very, uh, a very important, um, um, very important problem for, for North Korea. So, uh, you know, it could not start from the same base as his father. What he did actually was uh, basically modifying everything. So why uh, am I talking about reshuffling uh, political and military apparatuses? Because eventually he wanted uh, to be flanked by men he could trust. Actually, he didn't want to rely on uh, the same um, officers or the same um, politicians that, uh, you know, had helped and supported his father because he didn't know to what extent actually he could trust these people. So what he did was after a couple of years, basically in 2013, um, uh, what he did was reshuffling the apparatuses by, you know, uh, eventually demoting old people and promoting new people that could legitimize him and be very much, how to say, inclined to, um, to, to trust him, okay? But what is important and why I put this picture here, it's, it's not very clear, but I'm sure that uh, eventually you are uh, recognizing the man uh, over there. What is important is basically the fact that since more or less 2009, actually he started, you know, his father actually started to think about the possibility that Kim Jong-un could be the next leader. And since his father, his father actually was pretty much aware of the fact that his son was, you know, totally unexperienced. What happened was the creation of the so-called support group, okay? The support group was basically, um, you know, formed by three people, okay? The one uh, you are seeing here is, or was actually, was Chan Son Tech, okay, who was killed. Uh, in 2013. And then the second uh, person was uh, Kim kyung um wife of Chan Son Tech and actually uh, sister of Kim jong il And the third person was uh, Che ryong -ge. Che ryong -ge was a general, okay? Still, he is one of the most important military, um, um, 
you know, uh, man in uh, North Korea nowadays is the chairman of the Standing Committee of the Supreme People's um, Assembly. So in order to, trans to translate, actually, is the second in North Korea um, by importance. At that time, actually, uh, Tae ryong was vice chairman of the, um, um, of the Central Military Committee. Okay. Now, what was the role of these three people? Actually, they needed to support and prepare uh, Kim Jong-un in order to, uh, you know, uh, in order for Kim Jong-un actually to be um, skilled enough to um, rule over his country after his father. Okay. So that's why we are talking about the support group which you know was disbanded totally disbanded in 20 between 2013 and 2014 okay chanson tech was killed uh is on t actually disappeared uh she has not been killed but actually she has been marginalized and Cheryonge is uh, actually uh, the only one who is still uh, cooperating with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. But that moment actually, and these three people were very important in order to legitimize and in order to educate, if you want, uh, Kim Jong-un to uh, be the next uh, leader. Um, during these you know, during this uh, actually this extended period of time, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, Kim Jong Un uh, also um, revealed some traits of his character. Okay, uh, personal character and political character. Actually, the fact that he killed Chan Son Tak. Uh, in 2013 was pretty much important for the life of the North Korean regime. Actually, what we tend to believe is that Chan Son Tech was plotting against Kim Jong Un, you know, along with um, some people uh, in China. Okay, uh, some scholars actually uh, suggest that eventually the previous president of the PRC, Hu Jintao, was, uh, you know, um, eventually. Um, involved, uh, or the prime minister Wen Jiabao was was involved, or at least they knew what was happening. But actually, uh, what we tend to believe is that Chan Son Tech was plotting against Kim Jong Un, and Kim Jong Un eventually had no problems whatsoever in uh, you know um, killing him. Okay. Um, and this is uh, pretty much important in political terms because, uh, you know, these uh, started to make us uh, believe, to make us think that he was working towards his personal consolidation once, uh, you know, his father had died. Okay. Uh, the other important point uh, happened in 2016. And, uh, you know, what happened was the Seventh Party Congress of the uh, Korean Workers' Party. Okay. First of all, it was pretty much important because, uh, you know, there had been no uh, Congress in, 30, in 36 years, okay? So this was pretty much important because, uh, you know, actually this demonstrated again that after having consolidated his, his role in uh, North Korea, uh you know eventually he wanted to um bring to the very core of the uh, political system of the country the party again because what his father had done uh you know was relying on armed forces and eventually marginalizing the role of the party but you know uh eventually for uh kim jong un you know the party was pretty much important and uh you know actually he needed uh to bring the party um to its uh, original importance um again okay so there was a kind of correction in policy between um kim jong un and um, and um, uh, his father, okay? All right. Now, when we talk about Kim Jong-un, actually, um, we also need to uh, understand that uh, if we do compare him to his father or to his grandfather, actually, um, you know, and I'm sure that you are pretty much aware of this, he has adopted a very different leadership style, 
Okay. Um, his father, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you do remember his father, but, uh, you know, his father was very solitary man. Okay. He was, um, you know, there are you know, many, many, many scholars actually have written um, on uh, Kim Chong Gil by uh, eventually trying to investigate his uh, psychological details, okay, psychological attitudes. Um, he was a very solitary man. He was a very introspective man. You know, he, his grandfather, Kim Chong Gil, Kim Jong Un's grandfather was um, very different uh, in terms of um, personal attitudes, but of course, times were very different. Okay, um, the leadership style of uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, you know, is um, uh, eventually uh, totally um, totally different from um, his predecessors. Okay, um, he is a very he has relied and he has transformed the leadership. Um, um, because, you know, we basically see him. It's very easy that he goes around Pyongyang, he goes around, uh, you know, the, the country. Uh, you know, he has become uh, a so-called public persona. Um, and eventually, what else we can say about his leadership? That, uh, you know, basically uh, he has revealed a very high degree of pragmatism, a very high degree of transparency, a very high degree of institutionalization, uh, all characteristics that actually um, did not uh, belong to, um, to his father, okay? Uh, Kim Jong-un eventually has no problems whatsoever in giving public speeches. Okay, his father had a lot of problems because he was, um, you know, uh, not a very good speaker. Um, and eventually, uh, Kim Jong Un wants uh, to be always seen as a leader, a leader uh, to whom actually people can relate. His father wanted, uh, you know, didn't want to be approached. Uh, he didn't want to be approached by um, people in general. Okay, that's why I said he was a solitary man. Okay, he went around, but actually wanted people uh, to be distanced. Okay, Kim Jong Un is totally different. He wants actually to be overwhelmed by um, the internal audience. Okay, and uh, we have you know thousands of pictures that actually that actually testify this kind of attitude that he uh, has. Okay. Um, you know, um, the other point that I would like to raise is that, uh, you know, if you spend your time, like I do spend my time actually reading and rereading uh, public speeches and, you know, all the speeches that eventually are, uh, are um published by, uh, you know, uh, the Nodong Shimun mass media uh, in, in North Korea, you do understand that um, eventually, uh, for the first time, actually, Kim Jong-un has no problems in uh, um, pointing out the difficulties that eventually the country is going through. Uh, this is, you know, totally new, brand new. Uh, he prefers, actually, to... Uh, uh, you know, to transfer these problems to, um, how to say, to uh, put actually these problems on the table and eventually socialize these problems that the country has on the table um, in order to uh, make the population understand what kind of problems uh, the country is going through rather than concealing um, uh, these difficulties, okay? And again, this is totally new. This is another uh, new characteristic that uh, eventually um, um, he has adopted uh, during his uh, leadership, okay? And another, again, as uh, being the uh, regularization of the party congress in several meetings that eventually he um, held with um, um, uh, you know officials officials in uh, in the, in uh, in North Korea and various leadership meetings that he is always having with um, uh, people in um, 
uh, in North Korea. Uh, again, this means that actually, uh, you know, uh, or gives the impression, if you wish, that um, decision making has become a kind of collective process. I'm not saying that actually, uh, you know, very important decisions like, you know, performing a test, a nuclear test or launching a missile uh, eventually do not depend on the leader. Those are decisions that eventually the leader takes. But, you know, when it comes to economic policies or, you know, these kind of things that can be implemented in the country, actually what we tend to believe is that, uh, you know, he wants to uh, understand what others in the leadership circle think. And the other important point is actually the fact that he has um, adopted a different strategy if compared to his father, okay? Um, the new strategy called Byonjin is eventually uh, translated as simultaneous development. What are we talking about? Well, you know, uh, actually Kim Jong-un has always said that uh, eventually uh, what was important for his country were two pillars, okay? The first one was reforming uh, economy or making, uh, you know, economy works for the sake of the population. The other pillar was eventually, uh, you know, um, represented by the development of, uh, of uh, uh, the nuclear arsenal. Okay, so I'm not giving up with nukes. What I'm doing is eventually bringing my country to the next stage in order to make people, to, to make the international community know that, you know, uh, what I'm doing is serious. Uh, I want actually everybody to know that if they dare attack me, uh, actually, I can retaliate by eventually relying on a very broad um nuclear arsenal okay and this is uh this is uh beyond gene of course actually at the very beginning what he had in mind was uh trying to legitimize himself and his role by uh you know reforming economics and eventually giving more to the people okay um some reforms were implemented not very um uh, not very uh useful reforms uh you know the recognition of emerging markets actually was uh, pretty much important but that was done uh on the purpose of uh, uh eventually uh you know uh, getting um hard uh, currency from uh, abroad or decentralization of, of agriculture or eventually the building of uh economic zones actually uh 20 economic uh, development zones were uh, you know, were implemented um, through the, um, the, the, the implementation of a new uh, law, okay? Uh, what happened? What happened was that eventually, uh, you know, unexpectedly, if you want, actually North Korea started to grow from the economic point of view. Okay. As you can see there in 2016, um, Pyongyang had reached 3.9%. This was the peak, the highest point uh, the country had reached in the last 17 years. And, you know, this was uh, pretty much the success of, um, uh, of uh, Kim Jong-un. However, uh, on a different note, if you want, actually, uh, Kim Jong-un and the leadership um, have always been, you know, obsessed, or if you want, actually, uh, um, they have always relied on the centrality of, uh, you know, nuclear and missile weapon program. Okay, um, we can talk in the, you know, in during the Q and A about these specifically, but of course, actually, nukes and missile launches in the missile program actually have always been at the very core. Uh, of uh, uh, the North Korean political regime. And of course, actually, these two things, economic reforms in economic development and, you know, the arsenal um, are very, very, um, you know, only difficult, uh, only, only very, diff uh, only, uh, you know, um, very, um, 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 difficultly actually can uh, go along together.
Okay, it's very difficult because, as we know, actually, uh, these countries spend something like you know forty percent of the GDP in uh, weapons. Okay, so implementing uh, economic reforms actually uh, becomes very, very, very hard. And then, what he has done uh, from the diplomatic point of view mm. in the first six years. So more or less up until 2017, this was one of the two peaks. The first one was in 2013, the other one was in 2017. Actually, everybody was totally convinced of the fact that uh, there could be a war confrontation between uh, North Korea and you know, the South and the United States, of course. But you know, in the first six years, actually, what it did was uh, eventually having this kind of isolation, uh, isol, isol, I'm sorry, isolationist approach, okay? That basically means, you know, Kim Jong-un uh, didn't go anywhere and uh, he refused to meet uh, foreign diplomats, foreign delegations. He, he basically wanted to be isolated, okay? For specific reasons, eventually. Um, and the other point here, uh, when we talk about diplomacy, is also uh, the fact that uh, eventually up to 2017-18, the relationship with China was absolutely not good. We always talk, uh, scholars actually always uh, talk about, you know, this intimate relationship that exists between uh, Pyongyang and Beijing. What I can tell you is eventually the fact that from the economic point of view, actually, it exists a very, very strong relationship. But, uh, you know, from the political point of view, things are totally different. We need actually to free our minds uh, from the uh, fake message, according to which actually China controls North Korea. From the political point of view, it doesn't exist. It's not like that, okay? Um, we didn't have good relations with, um, with um, um, Washington and Seoul, and we didn't have uh, you know, good relations with uh, uh, with uh, Beijing, okay? Uh, why? Because actually, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un decided to launch missiles to have this kind of very, very vocal and confrontational attitude against Donald Trump. Um, uh, he performed nuclear tests. The last one actually was performed in 2017. Um, and of course, China was not entirely happy um, of um, uh, how Kim Jong-un was behaving because China as well actually needs the region to be stable. Otherwise, you know, um, you know Beijing uh, is, not, um, is not free to do what it wants, okay? Uh, so there was a kind of deterioration in the relations between Beijing and uh, Pyongyang. As you can see, actually, the first visit to China was uh, in 2018. Um, Kim Jong-un visited China for the first time in 2018, and eventually that was done on purpose because uh, eventually he was going to meet Donald Trump for the first time. So he wanted, before meeting with Donald Trump, actually, he wanted to, uh, you know, uh, um, get uh, eventually the suggestions that Xi Jinping could give him, okay? And the second phase, um, I will try to I will try to be um, a bit faster. But actually, the first phase was probably the most important one. But we need to understand uh, what kind of changes have uh, you know um, have affected, if you want, uh, North Korea. Uh, the second phase. The second phase is pretty much important as well. You know, January uh, 2018. Um, what happens in January during the New Year speech? What happens uh, is that Kim Jong Un announces the conclusion of the Bionjin policy. Okay, uh, why? Because according to him, actually, um, North Korea at that point had, be, had already uh, transformed itself into a state nuclear force. Uh, and this has, put, this has been put in the constitution as well. And uh, uh, what he needed to do, starting from that moment, actually, was to rebalance national strategy focusing on economic development, okay? So the binary 
uh, uh, the binary Bionjin policy could not exist any longer because uh, eventually these uh, these uh, pillar had been completed, so North Korea had to focus on the other one. Okay, uh, the other important point was actually the the uh, the, the the abolition of the Songun ideology from the constitution. The Songun ideology, as I as I said, uh, you know, his father had completely relied on armed forces, okay? And the Songun actually was his father's strategy, okay? Songun can be translated as military first, okay? So uh, military first and then the rest of the population. If actually you want me to translate this policy in a very brutal way, this also meant um, at the very um, at the very end of 1994-95, actually, when uh, North Korea was affected by this, you know, uh, huge dramatic famine, actually, uh, this was the the ideology, and this meant, you know, I need to feed soldiers first, and then, you know, I do not actually. Uh, I do not. I, I don't necessarily need to spend my money to feed my population. I mean, if they die, I don't care. As long as I feed uh, soldiers, it's okay. Okay. This was the ideology that uh, Kim Jong Il, his father, had. Okay. And of course, this can be understood because it was legitimized by armed forces. Okay. Uh, but you know, Kim Jong Un does not need this kind of um, ideology, and of course, actually, this is erased from the constitution. Um, and on top of that, in addition to that, actually, what he did was, uh, you know, eventually introducing the concept of people first. Okay, people first is kind of explosion in uh, uh, in North Korea. I mean, uh, putting people uh, at the very core of uh, uh, the country itself uh, is, you know, of course, we can still be talking about propaganda, but again, actually, launching this slogan was uh, pretty much important um, in order to understand Kim Jong-un's um, attitude. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually, Actually, what was important? What was important here was the uh, reprioritization of resource allocation. Okay, uh, resources actually had to be uh, allocated for the sake of people. Uh, look, this was the moment when actually uh, money started to be spent on the moderniz on the modernization of Pyongyang. And in fact, actually, if you go to Pyongyang nowadays, you do uh, see that you know the city has been re reshaped remodeled remodeled in a certain sense you know more cars and more buildings and you know everything seems more modern than it was uh, years and years ago okay and uh, from the diplomatic point of view what happened was uh, actually that Kim Jong Un started decided that he needed to uh, you know um, uh, eventually make a step uh what was the step actually there was an occasion a specific occasion that you can see in the picture that was uh you know uh pyeongchang olympic games okay winter uh winter olympic games that uh, were to be held in pyeongchang in south korea actually that was the moment when uh you know uh pyongyang launched its charm offensive okay um basically you know kim jong-un was invited by south korea to you know let uh, north koreans uh to go to pyeongchang and participate in winter olympics uh, that not happened. Only uh, the women's hockey team was sent um, from North Korea, but you know they sent delegations and cheerleaders, and you know um, actually this was a, a clear success. And this was also the moment when actually Kim Jong Un decided to play his diplomatic cards by reaching out, uh, you know, other countries. Okay, uh, so he opened to the uh, to South Korea. He opened to China. As we have seen, he opened to the United States by reaching out to Donald Trump, actually, and, and, and being reached out by Donald Trump. Okay. There was the first meeting in Singapore, the first meeting actually 
um, according to many scholars, was a su success. According to me, was nothing. But actually, this was a success, according to many. The, the, the good point was actually that uh, finally we found uh, the United States and North Korea, uh, you know, uh, sitting at the same table, talking. And that was very, very important. One of the consequences uh, of these was the moratorium that actually uh, North Korea self-imposed uh, on, uh, you know, nuclear tests and uh, ICBM tests. Okay, it it has uh, ended at least uh, from the point of view of ICBM tests, and you know, probably very soon also the nuclear tests moratorium will be ended. And then, actually, uh, what do we have uh, here? Actually, this is a, a very nice picture. I like it very much because uh, it actually tells you what were the attitude, what were you know uh, the, the 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 attitudes that actually these people had when they met for the first time in Hanoi in February 2019. Um, um, I, I, I mean, they were not happy, and in fact, actually, the uh, second summit was a failure, okay? It was a failure because uh, of many reasons. If actually you want, uh, I can uh, go back to these uh, during the Q&A. But, uh, you know, this basically the, the failure of Hanoi summit actually convinced Kim to move back to his foreign policy approach towards a kind of confrontational uh, attitude towards uh, both the US and South Korea. And in fact, actually, we have had basically no intercourse between these countries in the last, uh, in the last two and a half years, okay? Uh, on top of that, actually, the um, economy has deteriorated over the last three years, okay? Because there are so many problems, okay? So many problems. The first one is the imposition of sanctions um, uh, against North Korea. So, you know, the United Nations uh, Security Council basically has imposed so many, so many uh, sanctions that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, that, you know, uh, eventually um, uh, North Korea has become, for North Korea actually has become very, very, very difficult to overcome uh, these um, sanctions. And of course, in the last couple of, now, couple of years, actually, the pandemic and natural disasters, okay? So um, this has brought to uh, a, a very, very pronounced reduction in international trade, especially with, uh, with uh, uh, China. Uh, eventually, what is important here, I didn't put actually a picture of Kim Jong-un uh, crying and eventually apologizing in front of his people, but this has happened. And when he cried, actually, he apologized because of the failure of the economic problem, of the economic program, of the economic reforms that he wanted to implement. And he was not successful because of this and that, because of the United States, because of sanctions, because of this and that. But actually, he cried and he asked his citizens to tighten the belts to survive the economic hardship. So this, this is the so-called arduous march that uh, eventually uh, Kim Jong-un asked for, okay? Um, and then uh, the third stage, uh, and then conclusions. I think I have um, only uh, a couple of slides more, two or three slides more, so... Um, um, I'll try to uh, cut it short, but uh, you know, eventually, what happened? What has happened in July 2021 during the eighth the eighth party congress is basically the uh, you know um, the adoption of a new national strategy. Okay, um, what uh, Kim Jong Un has done uh, is uh, you know eventually. Uh, trying to go back to the origins, okay? So what he did was reintro uh, reintroducing the uh, Byongin line on the one hand, so again, economic reforms and adv advancement of uh, uh, nukes and missiles, and, uh, uh, you know, um, the old 
the old fashioned state socialist approach on the uh, on the other hand. So this is eventually what he's trying to uh, you know, what he's trying to do. Um, why? Because according to him, actually, these uh, you know uh, level, these uh, degree of um, um, ideological awareness needs to be re enhanced if you want, and actually is also calling back. Uh, you know, to the non-socialist and anti-socialist practices, because eventually, uh, you know, this this uh, kind of changing strategy is eventually, uh, you know, depending on the fact that um, actually, um, um, you know, um, he has noticed that something um, needs to be changed, okay? Otherwise, uh, you know, um, the um, legitimation of his role in legitimation of the King family can, uh, you know, eventually uh, be, uh, you know, suffer, okay? Um, the new policy focuses on uh, uh, achieving the self-reliance, so that's why we are again talking about uh, a return to Tutte. Tutte is the self-reliance policy, and re-centralizing -centralize, re the economy, okay? Um, so the policies that had been implemented six years uh, before had, you know, uh, have been reversed, and uh, uh, actually, uh, probably is also trying to reconfigure the leadership or the state relations with private entrepreneurs who have become quite, you know, rich and quite important for the economy of North Korea. But actually, this does not mean that uh, eventually they are part of the of the uh, of the state. And what he wants to do is eventually reprioritizing uh, rural development. Now, um, in order to come to an end, actually, I would also like to, uh, to highlight the fact that uh, there have been some, you know, high level personnel uh, reshuffles again. Um, the, um, the, minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, for example, actually has been changed uh, only eight, nine days ago. Um, and uh, these also mean that uh, eventually he wants to re-strengthen control over the party and state apparatuses. Uh, in order to do that, he has also created new institutions that eventually, um, you know, are um, a good um, a good tool in order to suppress uh, internal discontent. Uh, for example, he created the Department of Rule Investigation and the Department of Justice. Uh, and this department, of course, actually needs to take care of, uh, you know, possible uh, possible uh, social unrest. I'm not going. To, to say that eventually uh, the, 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 there's any possibility that, you know, this happens, but, uh, you know, of course, they need to take care of this possibility. And, uh, um, you know, of course, again, uh, ideological education has uh, become, uh, you know, very central and um, um, social control has become uh, eventually, again, very, very important, okay? Um, this has also uh, basically, um, this has also uh, basically um, been seen because of the extensive crackdown of foreign content that uh, has happened uh, very recently in North Korea. So, uh, I mean, um, you know, uh, actually, uh, you are condemned to 15 years of correctional labor um, for just watching uh, South Korean videos, okay, um, which is pretty, pretty, pretty um, kind of um, uh, widespread in uh, North Korea. It's not actually legal, but it's widespread. And uh, of course, as you all know, actually, uh, North Korea has, um, has uh, closed its borders with the People's Republic of China, more importantly, and with Russia because of COVID-19. And of course, this has meant that 
uh, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, you know, um, conditions have become ha have become pretty pretty dramatic in the uh, in the country. But again, the priority has become again, uh, you know, the nuclear arsenal and the missile uh, program. Okay, um, you know, uh, Kim Jong Un has tested uh, something like, uh, if I do remember well, thirty three missiles. Uh, from the beginning of uh, 2022, uh, 18 or 19 different launches. So they are potentially preparing for uh, a new nuclear test. This means that eventually, uh, you know, they are always pretty much focused on the development of the uh, of the arsenal. And actually, we have basically um, seen no modifications whatsoever in North Korean's attitude um, uh, after President Biden assumed office in uh, uh, Washington. I must say that actually President Biden in the very beginning had a very uh, kind of confrontational attitude towards uh, North Korea. Then, uh, you know, they... Uh, you know, Americans actually said that eventually they would um, talk to North Korea without any preconditions. But actually, you know, what has happened is that North Korea doesn't want to go back to the table uh, any longer. And especially now that, uh, you know, we do have, uh, you know, um, uh, a conservative president in South Korea. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And and then conclusions. Okay, uh, I have only one slide left, and two minutes. Um, so according to me, um, Kim Jong Un has consolidated his power, and eventually uh, he was very able to do that. Um, he was a very young man uh, who turned himself into a leader, and uh, you know, even without knowing uh, how. The machine, the political machine works, actually, he consolidated his power. He became a very, very, uh, you know, central leader for uh, North Korea. Um, and of course, actually, uh, a huge part of his legitimacy has been built on the developments that uh, both the nuclear and missile programs have uh, made, okay? Uh, but these, unlike his father, especially, these has been, uh, how do you say, this has been brought about by also uh, eventually eyeing the diplomatic factor, okay? That is, you know, okay, I am developing the nuclear arsenal, the missile, um, the missile program, but on the other side, actually, I'm trying um, you know, uh, due to uh, the threat that eventually I do represent, I'm also, uh, you know, uh, being very successful on the diplomatic front. And in fact, actually, this has been witnessed by the two meetings that Kim Jong-un has had with, with um, uh, the president of the United States. Okay. Uh, he has also, according to me, actually worked in the direction of, um, uh, you know, improving um, the living conditions of the of the people and the people first politics. Actually, slogan is there to um, tell us, uh, you know, how he's working this uh, direction. And uh, uh, eventually, the, um, the, um, uh, the fact that Kim Jong-un has tightened control, as I have tried to demonstrate in the third phase, is also dependent on the fact that actually he was not successful in uh, improving the conditions of economy in North Korea. And these, according to uh, some commentators, actually could undermine his legitimacy. Uh, domestically speaking, you know, political stability in North Korea and um, uh, all these um, uh, all these uh, uh, things. Okay, um, and that's all. I could uh, eventually stop here. Uh, I I'm I'm glad again uh, that uh, Eduardo can offer me comments, and then after that, I would be uh, pretty much happy to give you. Um, you know, to to if you want to pose me questions, I would be happy to uh, try to give an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor.
Thank you for sharing with us your long experience on the topic and your knowledge. And I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. But before that, I would like to introduce Professor Eduardo Luciano Tadeo to push the discussion. So Eduardo Luciano Tadeo Hernandez has a PhD in communication. He is currently an assistant professor and postdoctoral researcher in the Department of International Studies at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. He studied international relations at UPAEP, Mexico, and later specialized in Korean studies at El Colegio de Mexico. He is a co-founder of the Mexican Circle of, the, of Korean Studies, a, me a member of the Euroasia Study Group a member of the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative and a collaborator of the, at the Globalitica think tank. He has worked as a political advisor in the Mexican Congress and in an academic cooperation project between Mexico and Germany, Entre Espacios. His lines of research are public and cultural diplomacy of diaspora and non-state actors, gender and cyberspace issues, communication and international relations with a focus on Mexico and Korea. Uh, welcome, welcome Eduardo, Professor uh, Tadeo, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Professor Filippo Constantini for this invitation. I'm truly honored to be uh, able to comment, to give some ideas about uh, Professor Antonio Fiori presentation who is, as we have already seen, an expert on North Korean issues. Um, it gives me uh, more pleasure uh, because North Korea, the discussion of the North Korean regime seems not to be still a priority in academia in Latin America, but I am, I am assuming this is happening worldwide, right? This is not exclusive of Latin America. Um, but then we have the opportunity now to engage in a sort of global network of Korean studies to start moving forward the conversation about the regime. Um, there are certain aspects about the presentation of Professor Antonio Fiori that I have identified as a common trends in the discussion of the North Korean regimes. And there are other arguments that seem to be a surprise to me because uh, I have not seen this interpretation um, of the regime in most of uh, interpretations by uh, scholars in Latin America, at least. Um, first of all, I am really glad that Professor Antonio Fiori has approached to the North Korean case with a critical perspective, meaning that he's not necessarily emphasizing how unique or how exclusive is the discussion of North Korea in terms of the transitions uh, and also uh, in terms of the uh, continuity or change in the regime. So Professor uh, Fiori is actually uh, stating, as uh, from what I am interpreting, that North Korea, as might be any other country in the world, changing constantly. And what we need to do then is identify what are the drivers for those changes, right? So I was uh, asking myself some questions when he was uh, putting on the table the argument of this constant change in North Korea. For instance, who makes the change possible? Is it exclusively the leader? Is it uh, the political structure? Or is it perhaps a combination of the social reality of North Korea, political reality of North Korea, and the international system? Uh, so my the first idea that I would like to uh, bring to the discussion is that perhaps we need an intermestic approach when discussing about the North Korean change changes. Um, certainly, there are uh, particular national things happening, as Professor Fury has already explained, but there is also um, the context of East Asia, uh, the presence or the competition between uh, United States and China that is necessarily also affecting the Korean Peninsula as a whole, not only the North Korean issue. And I believe that's something that we need to take into account. 
Uh, now, I would like to mention certain aspects that might contribute to this debate about the change, possible change in North Korea and how this is taking place. Um, first of all, I do agree that clearly there is a maintenance of the Juche ideology as a leading principle of the regime under Kim Jong-un's uh, government. Actually, we can see this in cultural policy. Take for as an example, the North Korean art that is promoted or the North Korean cinema that is promoted during the Kim Jong-un regimes or the educational policy. Uh, Yuche as an ideology is thought in basic education in North Korea, but is also used as an element for international dialogue between North Korea and other countries. Uh, I'm referring here to, uh, what, for example, what the Kim Il-sung University does. They even have nowadays, as far as I'm concerned, a, a distance learning created uh, for those interested in Jewish ideology to enter and study this perspective uh, conducted by the university, by this university in North Korea. Also, this ideology is affecting foreign policy. Um, now I am thinking, for, for instance, about cultural diplomacy, which is something, uh, it's a discussion that we can have, whether if North Korea has a cultural diplomacy uh, implementing Juche ideology, or if they just make propaganda when they relate abroad, right? Uh, but just to give an example, I'm thinking about this project of the Angkor Panorama Museum uh, that was built by the North Korean uh, artists in Cambodia, by the North Korea, imposed by the North Korea government, uh, which is also a way in which the North Korea government uh, tries to uh, collect money with in, in international relations. And I believe this is, this is just an example on how in this uh, it's a debatable, as I mentioned, cultural diplomacy uh, activities. They are also implementing a huge ideology in re the relation, in the conversation with other countries. This gives me the opportunity to refer to this idea uh, proposed by Professor Fiori about the image of North Korea uh, changing during the time of the government of Kim Jong-un. If I'm not mistaken, he mentioned that North Korea's international status have improved during this period. That argument seemed to me seemed to me very interesting because most of the interpretations from the scholars is actually that there is a constant negative image of the regimes of the regime overseas. Uh, and my question is, when we talk about this uh, improved international status of North Korea who in the international system actually believes uh, that, that, that there is an improvement or that North Korea can be thought about in positive terms. I am certainly considering that that not necessarily might be the case uh, of the United States. I mean, constantly thinking of North Korea from that perspective, but that gave me the opportunity to perhaps mention that indeed there are countries in the international system that uh, sees North Korea as a very um, in viable inter, uh, inter political regime. And I'm thinking about some uh, African countries and some countries from Southeast Asia that actually made business with, with North Korea in the military sector and in other sectors in general. So there are countries indeed that believe that North Korea has a good image and that is positive the kind of policy they have to deal with international actors. A other element that I would like to mention that I believe is a, continu a part of the continuity in the regime is the family leadership that I believe remains fundamental uh, for the North Korea regime. Let's think for instance uh, about Kim Jo Jong, the sister of the current um, leader of North Korea, who now has been very visible in certain inter-Korean uh, dialogues, but also uh, is one of the most important promoters. Actually, she's in charge uh, of the publicity and information department that as Professor Fiori has mentioned, plays a very important role uh, in the regime. 
I believe one of the distinguished also aspects of Kim Jong-un's uh, ruling is the use of media both nationally and internationally in order to advance its national uh, North Korean national interest. Um, I have, for instance, observed during this time how uh, during times of crisis, the North Korean media, uh, Northern Shin Moon, and also the Korean Central News Agency have played a crucial role in promoting the government's discourse of having the capability and the willing, willingness uh, to exercise military force if necessary. And you know, international media reproduces this discourse. So I believe that's a very effective strategy, communication strategy by the North Korean government. Uh, now, let me mention something uh, about the current situation of the regime, because I believe this is fundamental to clearly understand, as Professor Fury has already mentioned, why there has been certain turns in the North Korean policy by Kim Jong-un in the past two years, uh, being the two most the most important one, I believe, the returning to the, politi the politics of Byongjin, where clearly uh, creating more nuclear capabilities and military defenses seems to be at the top of the priorities of the government of Kim, of Kim Jong-un. Um, taking that into account, I believe that that would be a great challenge for the regime in the future. This concentration once again on the military issues, taking into account that because of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and all the sanctions that have been imposed to the regime, uh, it's, it's becoming very difficult, as I see it, for the regime uh, to uh, better the economic situation in the country. Uh, just to give you uh, certain data that might help in the discussion, in 2020, when we started with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a de important decrease of investment uh, from the investment by China, like uh, around 80% um, of the investment decreased in North Korea. And I believe that would be in the short run, or that would be an element that ha would have a great impact in the North Korean economy. Uh, also, the fact that uh, less and less uh, possibilities for the international commerce to move products around, you know, uh, it seems to be, even military products, I mean, seems to be also another element that would make the North Korean economy be in difficult times in the near future. Nevertheless, it seems to be, and I agree with Professor Fury in these regards, uh, the returning to Byongjin, a way to legitimize um, the possible um, the possible economic struggles in the country and reinforce uh, the political stability, which seems to be the biggest concern of the government today. How to maintain political stability, even though there are all of these situations that are making hard uh, for North Korea, uh, you know, to maintain that stability in the near future. A other element that is uh, related to this policy is uh, the, the implications for the international relations of North Korea uh, of continuing with this military-based approach. We have seen that uh, in this year, in 2022. Uh, if you remember, we, uh, we saw some launching of uh, missiles at the beginning of the year. And there was, an, as has happened before, an international concern about the North Korean uh, military program. And even this was taken uh, to the UN Security Council in May recently. Uh, remember that the US tried to impose more sanctions to North Korea uh, just to be stopped that intention by China and Russia. So we are seeing now a strategic alignment of China and Russia with North Korea, uh, which is related, I believe now, with the Ukraine situation and all that is uh, implicated for the international relations. I don't believe that this necessarily would be, or this means that China and Russia will support 
in every single way in North Korea. I, I don't see this happening, but I, I will see that if the North Korean issue uh, can function as an instrument to deal uh, or to confront the United States, then it will be used by China and Russia. Uh, the same case uh, with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Uh, finally, there is some there is some comment I would like to make about the importance or the implications of this um, turning or returning of the regime to the military policy. Uh, the implications for Latin America, I mean, because this is something perhaps we have not mentioned, and I believe there is evidence that the North Korean issue impacts and has an influence sometimes for the Latin American uh, countries' foreign policies. Um, I am thinking about, for instance, uh, what happened in 2017 as an example of this. Uh, you remember we saw a North Korea nuclear test uh, in that year. And what happened at the time is the, that the Brazilian and the Mexican government made uh, some comments as part of their foreign policies um, and foreign goals about the North Korea situation. In the case of the, of the Brazilian government, they condemned North Korea launching of the, of the test. Uh, in the case of the Mexican government, they went even further. Uh, they declared, if, if you recall, uh, the resident North Korean ambassador at the time, Kim uh, Hyun Gil, persona non grata, and gave him 20, two hours to leave the embassy and get out of Mexico. It had an impact for the North Korean-Mexico diplomatic relations. Um, I believe that observing this will make us uh, assume that discussing North Korea is not, is not only a matter of trying to understand uh, what makes the country uh, you know, survive uh, to this century, but also is a strategy that we can uh, take into account for the Latin American countries in order to prepare for the possible impacts that the North Korean policies may have in the Latin American foreign policies as well. Uh, the more prepared we are, the better I believe we will deal uh, with any changes in the North Korean regime. I think I will stop here to give time to questions and perhaps to, to continue the conversation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Eduardo, Professor Tadeu. Uh, to to uh, start this discussion, to put so much meat on the on the on the table. And let's have uh, I will give Professor Fiori a few minutes for the comments. Uh, about uh, Tadeo's work, and after we we are waiting for the question. We are receiving uh, a few questions, and 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 in uh, twenty minutes, more or less, we end this conference. Thank you, uh, Professor Fiori. Thank you, thank you, Filippo. Um, wow, thanks a lot, Eduardo. This this um, um apart from the fact that actually you um gave some. So many comments, um, and I must say, actually, mo most of them are very um, difficult to um, reply. Um, I will go random, so because there are so so many things actually. Yeah, um, I, I will start from the end, which is not uh, you know the connection North America. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Latin America, uh, North Korea, because uh, basically. <laughs> You know, I'm 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 very um, I'm very um, unexperienced on that. But actually, you know, I I, I really like your comment. Uh, you know, which is you know eventually global. It has global validity if you want. And actually, I liked it very very much. Uh, if if actually you want to start from the what you call strategic alignment yes um that is that is something you know we are studying um at the moment i am studying at the moment because we need to understand look to tell you the truth actually i do not want to participate and i never participate actually to this debate 
um, where uh, China experts or America experts actually uh, lose their time, <laughs> according to me at least, lose their time actually debating on the possibility that China wants or uh, the China wants uh, eventually or will uh, participate to the deconstruction and deconstruction of the so-called, uh, you know, uh, international global order and the reconstruction of a new global order. Because I don't see actually that point. I, I don't think that China uh, wants to do that. China is too happy to live in these order in this international order that uh, actually was established in the wake of the Second World War, because this international order actually is the one that, uh, you know, China fits in. I mean, they want to, uh, they are always trying to find some adjustments in the order, but actually it would be too way difficult for China eventually to rebuild uh, uh, the international order from scratch. But this is not important. What is important is what you said, the fact that for the first time, actually, the um, UNSC, uh, or, of course, actually ignited by the United States, wanted, asked to um, implement new sanctions. And for the first time, actually, China and Russia said, no, I mean, no. But this was, I mean, this was pretty much understandable in a way. I mean, uh, sanctions, I, I've written a couple of things on that. And I know the point, but actually, if you want to read somebody who is much more prepared than me on sanctions, actually, uh, you know, the book Daniel Dresner wrote on sanctions uh, was probably the Bible. And actually, you know, he explains very well why sanctions are not the right way to follow. I mean, what we are doing, if we want to talk on the specific case, actually, I, I know that, I know that what sanctions are doing to North Korea is eventually not absolutely touching the regime, but, you know, the repercussions of sanctions are on the population. This is what we're talking about. We see it. If you go to North Korea, actually, you can see it very, very clearly. I mean, people who live in Pyongyang, and uh, of course, actually, I have no experience with the leadership, uh, but I'm sure that the regime is eventually absolutely not touched by that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that eventually Kim Jong-un is still importing, you know, alcohol from, from whatever uh, country in the West. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually those who are suffering are the are normal citizens, not in Pyongyang, because you don't see them actually suffering in Pyongyang, because we are talking about a very small portion of the population who can live in Pyongyang. But if you go to the countryside, actually, the conditions there are awful, tremendous, uh, traumatic. This is... Uh, I'm not implying that all, you know, sanctions only actually created those conditions because, you know, the regime made its part in creating those conditions, but actually sanctions are eventually totally useless. Apart from these, uh, apart from these, uh, a couple of things um, I would like to say. Um, Eduardo, thank you very much for, for the, uh, for the, 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 the generous words that you had towards my approach. Now, um, you know, a few years ago, actually, I, this is public and it's been recorded, so probably it's not, uh, but, you know, eventually. Um, you know, a few years ago, actually, um, I was invited by the South Korean embassy here, and I had, you know, this very nice, nice, nice conversation with uh, with people. They are always try to have, you know, very good uh, relations with South Koreans um, officers. Uh, on top of that, actually, I, I I've always been funded um, by South Koreans. I am grateful to South Koreans. Uh, my life wouldn't be the same without South Korea. So, I, and they know that. But, you know, because I am so critic, 
And at that time, actually, I criticized Park Yun-hye's attitude towards North Korea and the trust politique, actually. At a certain point, they decided they didn't want to talk to me anymore, okay? But I always try, actually, to, you know, to defend my ideas. And my ideas um, are very clear. And eventually what I think is that uh, the North Korean regime is a regime. It's not a paradise. I'm not actually the one defending the regime, but actually, um, and if only, you know, a very small percentage of what defectors tell us about the life in North Korea is true, that is a nightmare, okay? That, that's what I say. And I'm not actually a friend of Kim Jong Un. I actually I, I I have no interest whatsoever in defending the regime. I would I would like to be very clear on this. But actually, you know, I do think that eventually we need, from the political point of view, we need to study North Korea as we study every other dictatorship in the world. Uh, we do not need, and this is absolutely. Um, uh, this is absolutely unacceptable in a sense. Uh, we do not need to ridiculize North Korea. I have never called Kim Jong Un the fat leader because this is, I mean, it can be fat, but this actually, from the political point of view, is absolutely meaningless. Uh, I have never called, you know, I've never used expression or adjectives that actually you know, my colleagues use. I tend to be very, very schematic and very clear when I study North Korea and I study it from the political point of view. And on top of that, actually, I am one of the few who tends to study North Korea from the domestic point of view. It basically means I'm very interested in the, you know, in how the machine works, domestically speaking. That's why, unfortunately, I have to spend part of my day, you know, reading the KCNA, reading the No Dong Shin Moon, which, are, you know, which are actually, sometimes it, they make me laugh, okay? Because it's, it's propaganda, of course. And when, I mean, you are the expert in communication, so I have nothing to teach you on these actually when you know a regime works with propaganda you discover few things when i was when i was writing my second book on north korea i discovered that actually there was something related to italy in the kcna on a specific day which has never existed okay so we're talking about propaganda but actually this is how dictatorships works so we need to be very, very, how to say, very honest when we deal with North Korea. And of course, I really hate when people attack me saying it's not it's not your case, of course. But actually, I, you know, I have lived all of my life actually being attacked by journalists who know who know nothing about North Korea, but they tend to attack me just because, you know, I seem to be the one defending re the regime, which I'm not. But I try to be very scientific when actually I deal with, with uh, you know, with this country. And uh, of course, actually, um, I mean, one of the things that uh, basically I was, um, uh, I was um, maintaining, I was stating, you were very, very precise on these, um, um, uh, uh, is when you talked about the uh, improved status of North Korea. That, that, that is actually, uh, you know, a demonstration of what uh, actually I tend to say. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's not the improved status. It is not that, actually, that I was talking about. Um, it was more... It's more subtle in a, in a way. What I'm implying is basically that a country that has nukes, that has a very, very advanced nuclear um, program, a country which uses ICBMs, a country which launches missiles, actually uh, has been viewed 
by the international community as a threat, but actually, and this is international relations, this is pure international relations theory. We need to talk about the price to pay. Is it more convenient to pay the price according to which actually Seoul can eventually be destroyed or, you know, parts of Seoul can be destroyed and eventually millions of people, thousands of people can die, or it is better actually to pay the price to negotiate with North Korea that basically implies having the president of the United States of America being seated at the same table with a dictator. Because actually this is, you know, what we need to talk about, okay? What we need to understand. So what I think is that actually Kim Jong-un has, you know, has actually adopted a strategy that has paid off, okay? That, you know, a, a very, very, how to say, um, um, advantageous strategy because he has forced in a certain way. He has not, you know, he has not actually uh, decided to leave his strategy aside. At the same time, he has forced the United States and significantly this, the, the, the president of the United States to sit with him at the same table equally. This is kind of, you know, kind of uh, very, 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 um, how to say, um, brave. Um, exceptionally done. And again, I do not want actually the audience to, you know, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating with adjectives because actually I like Kim Jong-un or North Korea. What I'm saying is that the strategy they have played is something that eventually we need to take into consideration because they are eventually uh, uh, playing the, the the, the good strategy, according to them, according to the vision of the world they have, okay? The family leadership, yeah, when you talk about Kim Yo-jong, actually, I do totally agree with you. Kim Yo-jong, you know, uh, I'm not sure she will be the next leader, but I don't even know why we should be talking. And again, it's not against you, but against, you know, many commentators who periodically talk about Kim Jong-un being dead, dead and, you know, who succeeds Kim Jong-un? I mean, Kim Jong-un is very young, and even if he's affected by several diseases, actually, I don't know why we should speculate on his death. And, uh, you know, who can be the successor. I'm not sure actually Kim Yo Jong can be the successor uh, because of a number of reasons that of course you know uh, much better than me probably. She is a woman. She uh, We have never had actually a woman leading the, the North Korean regime. So we need to understand if a woman can lead the North Korean regime. She is very young. She is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, totally unexperienced as you remarked because she is, you know, uh, had the possibility to um, to to be involved in 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 few political actions, but you know we'll need to understand um, how it uh, uh, develops and many other things actually many many other things. Um, I don't know if you have questions. Uh, otherwise, I, I can yeah. go on. Yeah, we uh, just. To put some more questions from the public, we have two questions, actually. And so we read it for you. And because we are out of time and we give you, we can give you 10 minutes most and 10 minutes we, we have to close. Okay. Uh, the first question is, 
Uh, how did Kim Jong Un manage the pandemic crisis in terms? Okay, of uh, yeah, I can read it. Okay, I can read it, Felipe. Um, First, oh my, I, I, this I, is, I can right. Yeah, sure, sure. Read the uh, both of the them. Second. Mm-hmm. The second is a bit long. Uh, um, as Professor Fury explained previously, in the inside, Kim Jong Un promised people first and impro- improving people's living condition. He is on pressure with that. At the same time, there is a new South Korean president, Yuk Suk Yeol, who is conservative, has argued together with President Biden that they will, de- they will definitely as- ask North Korea for addressing human rights and humanitarian crisis in the future negotiation. So now, Kim Jong Un has pressure reading uh, regarding his people living condition from the inside and the outside. Which are the future scenarios for this? How will Kim Jong Un embrace this context? Mm. Okay, I will try. Uh, Felipe, uh, uh, this is a, a very um, timing questions, um, 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 very timingly question actually. Uh, how did Kim Jong Un manage the pandemic crisis? He has decided basically not to manage the pandemic crisis, or actually not in the um, you know in the Western style. Um, they are not accepting any help. Actually, uh, you know uh, the United States, South Korea, the international community through the COVAX have tried to offer help, to offer support to North Korea. Uh, they didn't even reply. Um, and it's easy to understand, actually, uh, as far as I uh, as far as I know, North Korea. You know, you know. Uh, eventually, if you provide vaccines, the provision of vaccines brought with it some kind of um, how to say tracing, if you want. Okay, that is, you need to involve um, uh, international. Uh, international doctors and, um, uh, you know, uh, we are not sure that eventually uh, North Korean doctors or North Korean um, specialists uh, are prepared to manage the uh, provision of vaccines to a population of 24 million people. Um, And, you know, they do not want actually uh, anybody to um, have access to the country in this moment. So, they do not want to be um, uh, controlled, if you want. And on top of that, actually, what we do suspect, and this is probably the, um, the, the best explanation I can give you, is that all the data that they are giving us are totally false, totally fabricated. Because, uh, I mean, it's easy. I'm not actually explaining here technicalities, but actually a country uh, which has no vaccines and basically, uh, you know, 99% of the population uh, is not vaccinated uh, against uh, COVID-19. This basically means that uh, it's incredible that actually you have less than 70 people there. Okay, uh, it's 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 not credible. It's it's actually you know less than seventy deaths uh, is something that nobody takes seriously into account. So possibly the fact that that they do not want any help also uh, you know uh, depends on these. What we know is actually they are talking with China and possibly uh, they have already accepted uh, some provision of um, Sinovac or they are waiting for China to provide some uh, doses of uh, Sinovac, okay? Um, On top of that, actually, you need to take into uh, consideration the fact that, uh, you know, the healthcare system is very precarious. I'm not saying actually the healthcare system in South Korea, um, you know, uh, does not work because this is false. They have a healthcare system. It works. The point is actually um, they have no machineries. And, you know, when you have uh, no machineries, actually the healthcare system, you know, cannot do more than it already does, okay? Doctors are very good, actually. 
but they do not have machineries and this is a, a, a limit, okay? Um, from the social point of view, I don't think as other scholars have suggested that eventually COVID can be a threat for the stability of the regime. It is not. If you look at what happened between 1994 and 1995, that was a dramatic period. That was the period when, according to Haggard and, and, and uh, Marcus Noland, actually, between the 2% and the 4% of the total population of North Korea died of starvation. Okay, that was a, a global disaster. That was a massive, dramatic event. Okay. In that moment, actually, nobody, nobody, you know, um, uh, there were no um, signs of riots or revolts against uh, Kim Jong Il. Okay, and nowadays the situation is much, much easier than uh, the situation that North Korea experienced in uh, the mid 90s. So I, I don't think that there will be any turmoil because of the COVID-19. The second point, the second question, <laughs> future scenarios. Uh, look, this is probably, this is a very difficult question, but it's probably e easier to um, reply uh, if compared to uh, the, the so many questions that Eduardo posed me. Um, this is a very difficult question. What I, what I can tell you is that um, when we talk about people first, and actually, I mean, you 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 are suggesting a good point. That is, uh, you know, um, Kim Jong Un is pressured. Kim Jong Un is never pressured. Is 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 never pressured because you know he can't be pressured. He is the leader. Okay, he can't be pressured um, from uh, the bottom. That is, society cannot pressure him. Okay, oh, he has made um, some. Um, 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 you know, promises to the people, and you know, he probably feels honestly uh, obliged to his people in eventually improving their conditions. Okay, um, but he's not pressured, and uh, he actually, at certain point as it has happened in the past, can go in front of his people saying, look, I was not able to, uh, you know, make any substantial economic reform. And implicitly, this means I was not able to improve your personal conditions because they are bad. Those who are there outside the United States, the international community, South Korea, they are bad. And so since they are bad, actually, I need to focus on them in order to preserve the country we live in, okay? So if I postpone economic reforms, actually it's because of them, okay? So the target must not be me. I am defending the state from them. This is propaganda that they always use, that the leadership has always used, okay? On the other side, actually, you're talking about, and you're you know, mentioning the fact that there's a kind of a new ticket between the new South Korean president, uh, Yoon so yeol and the President of the United States, the old Joe Biden. Okay, there's a ticket. Yeah, I mean they are actually Yoon. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean uh, that was uh, you know kind of uh, very ironic to me actually. Uh, Biden went to South Korea, and during the United States anthem, actually uh, Yoon Suk Yeol put uh, you know his hand uh, on his heart. 
like you know the anthem of the United States was his own anthem, which was you know very much criticized in South Korea, which is a very nationalistic country. Okay, but apart from these, actually, there's a ticket. But you know, I, I I don't know what's the name of the person who is asking this question. But believe me, the ticket actually we need to tell it very honestly. Uh, when you know they are not talking about human rights condition, they are not talking about the conditions of North Koreans in North Korea. They are not talking about humanitarian crisis. They are only talking about the dismantlement of the arsenal. This is the only thing that Americans have in mind. And nowadays, along with Americans, also South Koreans. That's why, actually, when I'm asked to give you know, recipes on North Koreans, uh, you know, on North Korea, they do not like the recipe that I, you know, I've always given them. That is, you know, abandon these, you know, CVID kind of recipe that is complete, irreversible, uh, verifiable dismantlement. This is the recipe of the Americans. Actually, we have seen that this is a failure. We need to address the issue from a different point of view, from a different perspective, trying to you know, get them to the table, negotiate with them, having a dialogue with them. And if they do not want to talk on their arsenal, well, let's talk about something else. The point with North Korea in the last, you know, let's say four, four decades has been that we have focused on the nuclear arsenal. Nukes actually are, of course, dangerous, but they are not using them as an offensive measure. And they are not so crazy to use nukes in order to attack the United States. They are North Koreans. They are not stupid. North Koreans, not stupid. Okay. They belong to North Korea. They do not belong to, you know, stupid land. Thank you so much, Professor. I will give last two, three minutes at most because we are totally running out of time to Professor Tadeo to a last uh, comment, uh, last, last words. Um, yeah, probably I will just take one minute because uh, I believe Professor Fiori has explained, uh, answered really well, uh, detailedly the questions uh, posed at him. Um, well, first of all, I, I would like to say that uh, this critical approach that Professor Fiori mentions on, on North Korea is something that we embrace, for instance, in, in this group I belong to, that is an, um, the Mexican Circle on, North Korea, and on Korean Studies, actually. Um, we try to move forward the idea that we need to talk about different Koreas and study North Korea as a state that has constructed its, re its regime, its uh, in the internal logics, even its national identity and so on, right? And it, and, it, and it also acts as a state in international, in the international sphere. Um, but Based on that, uh, my, my perspective is that in order to um, understand what might be this possible future of North Korea, we need, uh, just like uh, in any other case when studying another state, to continue observing what are the main drivers of, of the country. And uh, for that, I believe we need a uh, a constant and very attentive uh, observation of the country, right? Not only uh, to pay attention to North Korea whenever there is a crisis to come to a conclusion, but just as Professor Fiori uh, has mentioned to systematically try to see where the changes are taking place and where those changes are not taking place. Uh, certainly, I believe that uh, North Korea will be uh, still uh, seen from this uh, exotic perspective is going is going to be seen as a threat. That's not going to change soon internationally. That is going to be, that's a clear 
continuity of this debate. Uh, but now I believe that uh, with this conference we have heard today, you have other elements to also think critically about the possible change of the North Korean regime. I just will leave it there, Filippo, and I am really thankful for this opportunity and for having also the possibility to have this conversation with Professor, Professor Antonio Fiori. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Tadeo. Before uh, saying goodbye to our guests, I would like to remind you, remind you and share, if I can, wait a second, our call for papers for the Journal of Asian Studies that we are uh, organizing here. And we will dedicate a brief se a section of the third volume of the, of the, of the RIA about women studies, equity and quality in Korea and in East Asia. Of course, we are also receiving any kind of topics uh, in any time. So hope to receive a lot of uh, research papers. And now, thank you, Professor Antonio Fiori. Thank you, Professor Eduardo Daddeo. And we end here and have a great summer. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Thank you, Filippo.